Alright. Since it's uh, the month of Elul, I think I share with you guys something dealing with the month of Elul. Where did you go? Here we go. So um, usually usually we're dealing with the Perik Yomi for the Gospels. However, one of the things I want to share here since the month of Elul is a focus on the theme which is dealing with the shuva, and I think it's uh, important uh, for people to understand properly the shuva at its root. Right? We use the word, we hear it. A lot of people who come from the church, though, they don't have a, a, a real understanding of what shuva means. A lot of times you hear the word repent, right? And obviously, repentance deals with the concept of obviously you know to stop sinning or refrain from your sins and things of that nature, right? Um, but then f some people find themselves once again back into the pig pen, right? They're back there, and they're doing the same sin over again, and they're back to asking God for forgiveness. And so the idea, most people believe repentance just socially ultimately deals with forgiveness, right? That's usually how it falls in line. And uh, that's, and that's true, but uh, shuva deals with forgiveness as well, but there's, uh, there's another aspect to it. To shuva, obviously, we know the root is shuv, which means to return. And the way the rabbis define the word to shuva is to not go back and do the sin again. Never again. Ever again. That's the idea, a true teshuva. True teshuva is that you completely refrain from that one sin that you're dealing with. And that's the struggle, because uh, a lot of times that sin comes back up, uh, whatever it may be, okay? And there could be variations of a sin. It could be different sins. And ultimately, everyone's going to run across the sin again. And the idea here is, are you going to do it? <laughs> Right? Because Teshuvah reads, don't do it again. And so we, we understand the, the words of Solomon in the Proverbs, like a dog to the vomit, so does a fool to his foolishness. And that describes the human being when it goes back to the sin. Now, what's important about this with Teshuvah here is um, I'm sharing here from something called Chovot Oz from Rabbi Bachia Ibn Bechura. He was a, a rabbi who... Um, I'm trying to think where he lived at. Uh, he may, it may have been in Saudi Arabia he lived at. Anyway, he wrote a book called Chovot uh, Oats, known as The Duties of the Heart. It's, uh, and there's a volume in there that dedicates to Sha'ar HaTeshuva, the gate of Teshuva uh, that he deals with. And what's significant about this is that we just got done praying. We recited Psalm 27. And what's important about prayer is understanding that the, pr the word prayer in Hebrew, tefillah, Tefillah is from the root, lihit palal. And lihit palal does not mean to pray. It literally means to judge. Okay? And the idea here is that when we pray, the idea is that we're supposed to be judging ourselves. And so everything is deeply symbolic. One of the things I mentioned yesterday with uh, my message with the Shevet God, they're associated with the month of Ilul. And I mentioned how Rabbi Bech, uh, Rabbeinu Bachai and a lot of the rabbis talked about they were successful in severing the arm and head of their enemies because they were meticulous in the mitzvah of tefillin. And that the rabbis in Masechet Menachot say, hey, if you talk between tefillin shel Yad and shel Rosh, you violate the mitzvah of tefillin. And they went through all that. But one of the things we see here, tefillin is rooted within subjugating the senses of the body. Tefillin deal with judgment. A person is supposed to judge themselves. Yet last week's parasha, shoftim v'shotarim, you're supposed to appoint judges. Bechosh uh, in all your gates. In other words, we have gates. The gates of our eyes, the gates of our ears, the mouth. Okay, these are gates, and if we're not careful how we use them, we, we cause a blemish to enter into our soul. So the idea of prayer is about learning to judge oneself. Why? It's better you judge yourself now than let Hashem judge you when it comes to Rosh Hashanah. And Yeshua shared these words, the same words are found in the Talmud as well, that basically with the measure you measure, it will be measured to you. The judgment you judge, it will be judged to you. Uh, this is not something Yeshua created himself. This is taught in the name of from the rabbis in the school of Hillel. And therefore, the idea here that month of Elul is, a, is supposed to be a very serious time of introspection. You know, as I shared yesterday, people think it's a very warm and fuzzy time. It's the idea that you know, God accepts people for where they're at, and that is true. But people have to take the initiative to do a shuva where they break the bonds of actually repeating that same sin. And that's why people find themselves going back to the proverbial vomit time and time again. So... With that said, what I want to share here is from uh, from Sha'ar HaTeshuvah, from Chavot HaLevaot, with Rabbi Bachia Ibn Bechuda. And I want to share here some of the things he said. 
And it's, it's quite a, it's, it's a very long thing, so we'll cover this for the next couple Sundays, God willing, up to, uh, the month of, uh, to the month of Tishrei. So he says over here, he says it's very clear to us that through reason, from what is written in the Torah, he says, HaKatu B'Torah Ki Hadam B'Katser Ma'asot, um, that the human being falls short in fulfillment in fulfillment of obligations to, to fulfilling their duties to the Creator. Man falls short. And so reason tells us that man and that regarding with man we find is subject to diverse natural forces, composed of divergent elements, possesses conflicted traits of character, and must adapt to change the circumstances. According to his deeds are also diverse. They include noble and reprehensible, excuse me, reprehensible, the corrupt, and the lust, the good, and the evil, and hence the need for the restraining bonds of revealed laws and the restrictions of the political orders. So what the rabbi is talking about here is that because human beings have such a unique makeup, genetic makeup, okay, that they have so much conflicting issues going inside of them. Think about a person who struggles with alcohol. Where did they get that struggle from alcohol from? The chances are they had someone who's an alcoholic in their family. Maybe it was a mother, a father, a grandfather, a grandmother, maybe an aunt, maybe an uncle, somebody there, and that's actually running into their DNA. And so here they are, they're a believer in Hashem, and they want to be able to serve God, but yet they're struggling with an addiction. It could be a drug, it could be a substance, it could be lust, it could be chase some money, right? They have anger. All the different makeups how people are hardwired basically differs from person to person. And it's not so easy to break those straights. This rolls inside of them. And therefore, what he mentions here, the Torah is the thing that's actually, that God has given to help us to be able to restrain the Yitzhahara from taking control of us. And he goes on to say afterwards, Aval ma shekhatu Torah. He says, as for what is written in the Torah, regarding this matter here, about the human being being composed of these, these various struggles, it's written over there in Parashat Bereshi, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, that from the actual man's heart, his impulse, his Yetzahara, starts from his youth. Everything starts from the youth. So when a person's hardwired a certain way, it starts from the youth. And the word menu'orav here, the concept of youth, what constitutes youth, the rabbi is asked in the Talmud. And like, when does the Yitzhahara first prevalent? When does it first appear? Because in Jewish law, a child is not obligated for any of their sins until they're barb at mitzvah age. But yet they still have traces of, you know, bad characteristic traits within them. And it's up to the parent to help correct that. So by the time the child is barb at mitzvah age, they, they, they perfect, they recti rectify that, that trait in them. So next time that child has children, that, that, rec that, that blemished trait is not there no more. It's been rectified because it was taken care of by the parents. But if it's ignored, it will be repeated in the next generation. And so Chazal mentioned that the Yetzirah begins stirring as soon as the baby's formed in the womb. <laughs> it starts in the womb. Why is that? Because there's a soul-to-soul -soul connection with the mother, the DNA of the father. It's automatically, Hashem puts the soul into the, into the mother's womb, but yet the DNA, everything starts. So guess what? A person has alcoholism and drug addiction and all types of depression issues. The moment they start forming in their mother's womb, it starts there. And if these things are not checked, you know, by the time the child is growing, and then by the time they hit 13 and 14, they go through the teenage years, 12, 13, and 12 and 13, they start developing in that and they attend a young adult, they start basically, it becomes a part of them, and God forbid they get set in their ways. And he goes on to mention, and he says, um, uh, he quotes from Eov, I like this passage here in Eov. He says, also, Vene uh, Amar, it says in Job chapter 11, verse uh, 12, Va'ir pera adam, it says, Yivaleid, that man is born as a wild donkey. A wild donkey. That's right. That's what the Yitzhahara is. It's a nefesh behemah, a nefesh hatenua, the spirit of mobility that moves like an animal, enticed by the desires of the flesh. And he goes on to say, Behold, even the moon is not as bright, or the stars are not pure in his sight. How much, how much less man is a maggot, a rima, has better value than man, is what he's saying here. And that's another passage from Job 25, 5-6. And the question is asked, also in Job, 
Uma Yiske Yilod Isha, you know, how can he, born a mortal woman, be upright? I mean, right? We take a look at the human race and hope his tears will be lost. And he goes on to say, since it is clear that man fails to live up to his obligations, it was strictly out of the kindness of Hashem in his love and compassion for man to give him the ability to be able to do a tikkun, to rectify his error and make up the loss of his service by doing shuva and returning to him. And this is true because technically the penalty is that when a person does sin, they should be killed immediately for it, violating the king's decree. But Hashem allows time to pass for a person to do shuva. And this is where people, if they're not conscientious spiritually, where they become desensitized, and the sin nature becomes justified. The bad habit becomes a part of their personality. And this is how they get set in their ways. Why? Because God allows time to pass for the sinner to do shuva. But when they don't jump on the shuva process, that becomes justified. You know, there's a saying, I think it's in Masek of the Zahar, it could be in Masek of Sanhedrin. Chazal say, the Yetzirah comes and says, hey, do a little sin this day, do a little sin that day, and the next day go worship idols. Right? So in other words, like something that's so extreme to the human mind would be imaginable, but yet it becomes justifiable when you start justifying certain sins. And that's why Shuva, it, people find themselves going back to the proverbial vomit because they have not really did true Shuva. It's, it's still part of them, uh, the, the nature. And he says, Hashem allows us wide-ranging excuses when we stray from the path of His service. And has promised to accept our shuva and quickly favor us, even if we have long defied his word and violated his covenant, as he clearly stated in the passages by the prophet Yecheskel. When over there it speaks about Russia, a person who is wicked, that if a wicked man turns from his wickedness and he does righteousness, that is because he would live based upon that. So you could be one of the most wicked of wicked. In fact, Chazal say the day a person does shuva is like the day they become born again. Right? You never existed before. When you do Shuva, your former existence, you are never here. Right? It's everything is moved away. And he says, since the righteous are of two kinds, he says, Hachad regarding one, he said, those who have always been free of sin and transgression. In other ones, the Siddiquim, they never sin in a day of their life. Or maybe they told a white lie, but they never did anything to struggle with sin, to know what it's like to do Shuva. Those are the ones Yeshua said, I didn't come for them. And second, he says, he says uh, regarding the Hasheni, the second is those who have done shuva of their sin, and as the great majority of the righteous are considered penitent, we learn by David the Melech in Psalm 32, 1, he says, happy is the one pardon of his transgression, and also forgiven of his sin. And then follow with the other class, those who have escaped sin entirely. Even though this class is higher in excellence, Spiritually noty, worthy. The reason for this is that every penitent was perfectly righteous before he sinned. But not every righteous individual is a penitent. That's powerful. We say in the beginning, Elohai nishama shenatata bi. My God, the soul you place within me, tachala. It's pure, right? So in other words, just because a person sinned, that doesn't actually take away from the purity, the pristineness that's in the soul. They just have to clear out all the schmutz, all the garbage in the way. But he says here, not every righteous person is a penitent, is worthy as a Baal Shuvah. What that means is, you have a person who grows up in the yeshiva all in his life, right? They don't know what it's like to struggle with, let's say, sexual sin. They don't know what to struggle with money laundering or maybe other sins out there, right? They never lived that life. However, even though they're righteous, they're not exempt from doing shuva. But because they think they're so righteous, they don't know how to do shuva. And this is what the rabbi is saying here. There's a lot of deceived religious people out there. And they need to do shuva just as well as the guy from the streets, the secular individual. And he goes on to say, for this reason, the sages established the matter of shuva and forgiveness at the beginning of the Amidah. When we say over there, the Indian Hatishufa, Habecharot Sebi Shuva, when it says God desires to shuva. Right before we ask for God for the forgiveness prayer. And he says, God is the one who, who's the one who generously forgives. Harold say, who desires to shuva. If there's anything that God desires, shuva. And what the, what the 
uh, Rabbi Bachia in Bebekud is saying here is that if most people understand the power of Shuva, they don't have to wait for the Yom Kippur to come around. Because the sages, when they enacted the, um, the, 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 the prayer, the Birchat Teshuva, the request for Teshuva and the forgiveness prayer, is supposed to function as a ministry of Yom Kippur. God is willing to forgive you if you're willing to do the Shuva. Now, we see that also in the Brech HaLashah. In Yochanan, his epistle, it says if we're willing to confess, he's willing to forgive. So the idea here is up to the human being, though. It's up to the human to root, uh, to uproot themselves, to to be able to uproot the shoresh, whatever that root is, to be able to have that forgiveness and have that shuva. There's no need to wait for Yom Kippur. You can do it here and now. The rabbi goes on to say, he says, uh, it's now, he says, it's now fitting for me ata to explain at this matter, levair bidifrei hateshuva asra in in the anayim. Uh, these ten aspects of teshuva. He says, Achat, mash teshuva. What is teshuva? Two, how many classes is it divided into? Shli shli. What is the prerequisite to a person's teshuva? Revi'i. Four, what is the essential elements? Chamishi, what is the conditions of each of these essentials? Shishi, also ways in which a person is moved to do shuva. And also he says, Shivi'i, is, is, the, is the Baal Shuvah, the repentant individual, the equal of a righteous person who has always been free to sin? In other words, if a person does a Shuvah, can they also be at the same level as a righteous person? And he goes on to say, uh, Hashminin, eight, is the Baal Teshuvah? Well, I already said that. Oh, things that inhabit the Shuvah. And also we move on to Hatish, Hatish Nine, is it possible for a sinner to repent of every sin? Is it possible to be able to break the bonds of all those sins? And also he goes on, the 10th principle. What counsel is there for those who find it difficult to repent of their sin? And this way we'll cover all these aspects, and this is what most of the Shars of Shuvah is. We're not going to go through all of them, but we're going to just break down a little bit here. So he begins to ask the question here about the first one. He says, Mahuta Teshuva. What actually is the essence of teshuva? What really is it? As once again, as I mentioned, a lot of people who come from the church, repentance is mostly identified with forgiveness, right? There are always people who are repenting, asking God for forgiveness. And I, I do, everyone generally wants to be able to break something. People are born a certain way, they're wired a certain way, and they want to be able to overcome. And so the idea here, that's why we have such a broken world, because people end up thinking life is hopeless. They give up. And they go one way. And they think hope is, hope is not lost. And they have to understand the power of teshuva. So he wants to know what is really the essence of it. And, you know, the meaning of teshuva is that a person writes himself and returns to the service of his Father in heaven, restoring what he lost after having deviated from violating it. And this is really the true meaning of teshuva, what Rabbi uh, Bachia Ibn Pakuda says here. You know, there's a lot of religious emphasis at this time of the year. In Judaism, and a lot of it could be lost between all the all the minutia, and the real purpose he nails it on the head here, without getting so kabbalistic with it, is that he says restoring what he lost. Every human being has been sent in this world for a divine mandate. There's a mission. We all have gifts. We have talents. We all have skills. The problem is when we muddy ourselves, soil ourselves with bad habits that become sins. They become a part of us, and we lose the fiber, the essence of what we were designed to be. That's why people end up giving up in life, because they have something. They live with a resentment. God has designed each human being to come into this world for a specific task. But the problem is, why don't they reach that task? Because something happened. So Teshuvah is about reclaiming why you were brought here. That's really what it is. It's not about looking how holy a person could look like in the synagogue, Right? Let's be honest, not everyone's designed to be a, a, a clergy person, a rabbi or a kohen or whatever the case may be. God has given everyone different tasks and talents, and they have to be able to find that and, and reclaim it for themselves. And so when most people find themselves close to age 60, they think their life is done with, you know, because they look back in such regret. And that's the biggest lie the Yitzhahara sells a person. You know, I've shared this before. You know, God is in the business of rectifying time. You know, Moses at the beginning in Devarim, Tells the Jewish people, it should have took us 11 days from Mount Horeb, Sinai, to get to here to the border of Israel. It took us 40 years. Why? Because sin creates space. 
You know, like a scientist creating molecules. But the idea here, putting molecules to separate with space, but the idea here is that when you do the proper shuva, you can actually rectify that time. Why? Because you're going to deal with the issue that has been causing the space in your life. The thing is, are you willing to face it? Are you willing to overcome? And this is, this is very important because this is tailor-made situation. The person who might be sitting there trying to elude addiction. Let's say they went for smoking pot and they end up on heroin or crack. And when life is actually giving them a lot of difficulty and they've been basically drug-free for X amount of days or maybe a year and something happens... And next thing you know, the biggest temptation knocking at the door of their mind is that drug. And they might find themselves in the room with the drug. They might find it where they're getting ready to smoke it or inject it. They might have it right there. And the thoughts are flooding through their mind. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Should I not? In other words, everyone is put face to face on the precipice of a temptation. That's where it either makes or breaks a person. And every time the person gives in, they separate themselves from fulfilling their purpose because it's preventing them. And then what happens is people live in regret and then the depression comes and then the low self-esteem comes and then people are stuck in a very low cycle of life. They don't think nothing of themselves. They think God is not happy with them and therefore they're losing out. And so what the idea here is when a person is faced with that opportunity, that's why the tests never go away. That's why the temptation comes back because God is the one giving it to you. Because he believes that you can break it to be able to rectify the damage. But it's up to the human being. So the rabbi goes on to say, This deviation could arise out of man's ignorance of Hashem and the ways of serving him. Or because of his base instinct. The Yitzhahara overpowers his, 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 uh, his nefesh hameskelet, his soul. Or because he ignores his obligations to God. Or because he associates himself with bad companions who entice him to sin. So what the rabbi is saying here is that when people allow themselves to become defeated, the reason why teshuva is hard is because there's multiple factors that are now set up. You know, I had a guy tell me one time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future, right? In other words, the environment a person associates with himself tells it a lot about which their path is going to be in the future. If someone has great you know, quality with inside of them, but they have allowed themselves to seep so low, that shows you what they think about their future, if they're ever going to redeem it. If you ever wonder why, like places like strip clubs and bars at night, why they're filled with the people they're filled with, if you were to go in there with like an EKG, an energy reader, and read the energy in a place, like, yeah, sure, it might look lively from the outside, music playing, you know, loud mouths, but it's negative energy, it's low energy. People are in there because they're not happy. They all share the common interest. And what happens when people get with people? A guy goes up to the bar and meets a girl for a one-night fling. They go home and have relations. You know what's happening? Energy is being exchanged. Energy. She's sharing his energy. He's sharing her energy. And the cycle of negativity continues going on. And so what happens is a person's environment. Or, you know, and then the eight Sahara causes a person to lose hope. They don't bother studying the ways of Hashem. They're ignorant of the Torah of this matter, and they don't have any hope to press through. And he says, deviation from the service of Hashem can occur in one or two ways. Either by not doing or ignoring what he has commanded us to do, or by doing what he warned us not to do, with the intention of rebelling against him. Chasa Khalila, God forbid. If one's deviation from service consists of only in neglecting what Hashem commanded us to do, the way for him to do shuva of this family is by endeavoring to do what is right and by adhering to the essentials of teshuva, which we will learn later on. But if it consists in doing what Hashem warned us not to do, the way for him to redress this failing, failing is by being careful not to revert to any form of what is forbidden act, endeavoring to do its opposite by adhering to the essentials of teshuva and its requirements, which we'll also explain later. And so he gives a much more analogy via a parable dealing with a person who becomes very ill, deathly ill. And he says, regarding such a person, he becomes ill because he became malnourished. He neglected his diets. You know, there was something that just came on the news. There was, a, there was a teen, it was a sad story, who just died. I think the kid just died. And what happened was, the kid became permanently blind. 
and they couldn't figure out the kid was completely healthy. And I think it was in the UK. It was in the United, it was in the United Kingdom. And, um, and what happened was the kid confessed that he was not eating anything nutritious. He was eating like snacks and basically like, you know, chips. That's all in hot dogs. That was it, especially with all the nitrate in it. And so eventually what happened was he was doing this. I don't know how his parents, you know, like they let him get away with this. And eventually what happened was he started having these issues. And uh, he started saying he was going blind, went permanently blind. And they couldn't figure out why. And then he confessed about his diet. And then it registered to them, oh, let's, you know, let's have him take a test here to see his, 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 his levels. They realized the kid, like, basically caused him to blind. Sadly, like, over a year later, he died. So in other words, when the person, even within just a, it doesn't occur to us when we eat every day. But he's using this as an extreme spiritually, the, the spiritual diet. He says, either a person abstains from eating nutritious food or he ate that which is harmful and undermined his health. If the illness was caused by not eating enough nutritious food, the only way for him to recover from his health by is increasing the consumption of foods and medicine suitable for his nature until he returns to a state of equilibrium. And once he returns to this normal condition, he should observe moderation in his diet. If the illness was caused by eating foods that were unhealthy, the only way for him to regain his health is by abstaining from such food and by eating foods of the opposite nature until he returns to a state of equilibrium. And once his body recovers and regains his proper balance, he should eat foods that stand midway between two extremes. He's actually alluding to the Rambam. Don't be too overly righteous. Don't be too overly wicked. Find a balance in the middle. And he says, Scripture has likened sins to unhealthy food. As it says in the words of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 29. And he says over there, Jeremiah says, uh, let's see here. Ki im ish ba ono ya mutko ha adam ha ochel ha boser. Each person will die for his own sins. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be blunted. And so, obviously, that's a metaphor, right? For this, your spiritual diet. What you put in is what comes out. And therefore, if a person eats unhealthy things spiritually, their life is consumed with these things, uh, then basically they're going to have a bad problem, spiritually speaking. And so he goes on here, and uh, I believe I want to cover right up to here, chapter 2. Yeah, yeah, chapter 2. He says, That there is three kinds of teshuva. The first kind is that of one who does teshuva simply because he finds no opportunity to repeat the transgression. But when the opportunity presents itself, his Yetzirah overcomes his soul, and he does not refrain from doing teshuva, or he does not refrain from repeating the offense. Then after he has committed the sin, he realizes the shamefulness of a deed, and he regrets it. Rabbi Bachai, uh, Bachai Ibn Bechuda says, such a person who does this shuva, he does shuva only from his mouth, but not in his heart, with his tongue, but not in his deeds, and he is bound to be punished by the Creator. May his name be blessed. Such a person who does shuva like this, it says there in the scripture to him regarding in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, sacrifice of all, follow other, other gods for a new experience, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say that we are safe? Has this house, which bears my name, become a then of these? Remember, that's the scripture Yeshua quoted when he went in. Why? Because what was happening in Yeshua's day was the Jewish people were basically abusing God for their own desires. They were exploiting things for religious purposes. And Yeshua was upset by that. Now in this passage in, in Jeremiah, this got to a point where the Jews would go out and co-mingle their worship with Hashem by basically worshiping idols. They would do a murder. They would sleep with another man's wife. And they would think that, hey, well, the letter of the law says I could bring a chatat offering, Right? So in the letter of the law, I did this sin, I will bring this offering at my house of worship. And God says, what do you think, I'm a fool? You think I don't see what you were doing over there? You think that you can rectify damage by basically offering the sin offering and then go back and do the sin again? You see what he's talking about here? This is how the Jewish people were doing in the first temple. They were doing it in the second temple. And this is also how the human being does today and today. We recognize all, oh, you know, I can imagine in Jason Jeremiah, I'm, I'm so bad. I didn't mean to kill that man when he walked in when I was sleeping with his wife, you know. <laughs> Felt bad, right? But his wife chose me, not him. So what's the offering? Okay, let me bring a sin offering, right? 
So I bring, I bring a big sin offering. But I'm still going to go back and see, continue having relations with the guy's wife. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, we think, like, well, that's crazy. But you know what? The hyperbole of that, even though it was physically done in those days, well, if we break it down microscopic, on a microscopic level, it's what we do every day. We go, we do something, and then we have this busha, we have this shame. And we, we, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, Lord. And what happens? We go right back to the vomit. Now, once again, it, 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 there's a difference to every human being. Everybody has their own struggle. Everyone has their own personality trait. Okay? The person who runs back to gossip is just as guilty as the person who runs out there, you know, basically who commits adultery. Okay? Or the person running out there to, to shoot heroin in their vein. All right? Or the person out there, you know, robbing people. It doesn't matter. Sin is measured in re relation to the sinner. And that's the idea here. And so this type of teshuva is not good teshuva. So the teshuva or the repentance that most people recognize in the church world, um, uh, uh, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, and they run back and do it, this is the type of teshuva the rabbis explain it. It's not good. It's not a good teshuva. And he says, okay, uh, regarding the second teshuva, it's one who repents, who does a teshuva in his heart and with his limbs, who resists his Yetzahara with the aid of his soul. In other words, he's depending here on his spiritual strength. He disciplines his soul, and he says basically by fighting the desires of the body until he subdues it and keeps it from what is hateful to his shem. His, his, his basically, the body, however, wants him to incline to what is contrary to serving Hashem. It yearns to disobey. It tries to restrain. At times it overpowers him. And at times he overpowers it. And he says such a person here is not committed, committed to the way of Shuvah that leads to atonement until he separates completely from that sin as it says there in Isaiah chapter 27 verse 9. He says over, uh, bizot avon Yaakov This is how the sin of Yaakov will be forgiven, literally shall be atoned. Only this will bring full removal of his sin. And it says, <laughs> He says, when all the stones of the altar are shattered pieces of chalk, so the at the ashraim and the incense altar should never return. This is powerful. What the rabbi is alluding to in Jeremiah or Isaiah is basically when God told the Jewish people, you prove to me you don't worship idols anymore in the literal sense by basically taking TNT, the equivalent of blowing of something up, decimating the idol you're worshiping until the, the rock turns into small pebbles. In other words, show me you're done with the sin by destroying it. What did Yeshua say? If your eye causes you to sin, rip it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, he wasn't saying that literally like an extremist, God forbid. It's a metaphor that whatever is causing you to sin, get rid of it. Why? Because you're going to continue to go back to it. And here, what the rabbi is saying we see a person that allows that thing that, that, that they're struggling with in their life. There's some days, it's like the, the Chinese proverb. Sometimes you chase the dragon, and some other days the dragon chases you, right? Good term for the Jewish term, the Yetzirah. The idea here is that if you allow whatever it is you're struggling with to stay in your life, you might have some days where you'll fight against it and you'll overcome. But there's going to be a lot of days you're going to get defeated. Why is that? Because you're not strong enough. And the only way to actually overcome it is by destroying it. I've heard stories, and you know, to the world, this sounds crazy. Of you know, uh, you hear people destroying their cell phone. <laughs> you know, they have to get rid of it, completely get rid of the cell phone. Why is it? Because it's causing them to take up their time, or maybe they're looking at uh, you know immoral websites online, or maybe they're engaging with someone from their office they shouldn't be engaging on WhatsApp, right? Illicit text messaging. They get rid of it. Maybe the television is calling them to sin. Maybe their laptop's causing them to sin. Maybe their car is causing them to sin. Maybe the clothing they wear is causing them sin because they're prideful and arrogant. The jewelry they're wearing, destroy it. Literally get rid of it. This is what it's saying here. It says, until 
He levels the stones of the altar like shattered pieces of chalk. In other words, you decimate the very thing you're struggling with. You have not cleared atonement for your teshuva. You're going to continue to stay in that fight. You might overcome it one day, but it's not going to overcome you the next. It will overcome you the next day. And this is real. How many people find themselves in the middle of a struggle and they become a victim of it and they feel bad and yet they're truly trying their best to overcome. They're trying to spiritually discipline themselves. They'll fight back. They might fast a couple days and they're trying to fight back. And yet what happens is this happens when the Yitzhahara comes to you at any time. Yitzhahara comes along and tries to bother you. Yesterday I shared in the teaching that the rabbis of Masech and Menachot, they mentioned, hey, you know, in Jew, I said Jewish law that if someone loses one of the tefillin, like the shell rosh, and they, they only have the shell yad, they're still required to put one on, even if they're missing the other. You know why? Because these have to do with trying to subjugate the animal for within. So it's better you have one than you have none. It's better that you try to, you, you keep it in check versus not keeping it in check. <laughs> Sometimes your head is not here. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the rabbis are meaning by that. So, sometimes, trust me, you're in the middle of, what is prayer? That's why when they say, hey, it's, pro it's prohibited to talk between tefillin shel rosh shel yad, they're not talking about that in a literal way, which by the way, in most Orthodox synagogues, men run their mouths like women sometimes. Like, you know, shut your mouth, we're here to pray, not here to talk. But the idea of that is who's the one talking? The Yitzhahara. It comes to your mind. Now you might think, and it's not a place to think of illicit sin, Right? Sin is measured in different ways, okay? It's the idea, whatever the Yetzirah can take your mind off of. Your mind is over here. And so the idea, the symbolism of the tefillin is that, hey, make sure you subjugate that animal. Why? Because if, if not, it's going to overcome you. And so a deeper part of teshuva is right now, a person needs to look, what is it that's causing me to stumble from time to time? Excuse me. What is causing me to stumble from time to time? Right? What is it? And so you got to ask yourself that question. And then you got to be able to muster the strength to say, you know what? I got to get rid of this thing. I have to get rid of it. Now, this is, this is what hurts for some people. Some people hurt. They might lose money on that thing. I, had a, I have a friend in the United States. He's an entrepreneur. Bright guy. Bright. He has a successful business now. But in the beginning, it wasn't doing that great. Let me tell you why. Because he, he was basically a schlepper. He was not actually maximizing his potential and he got into depression because he made some bad business investments. He also had a problem with the women. Going out, splurging a little too much, being the, the pretty boy, attracting the girls. And so he would find himself going home on downtime. You know, he was into video gaming. Spent like $3,000 on the gaming PC. You know, whatever you're into, right? You know, people have hobbies. So he's sitting there and it just occurred to him that... He was losing motivation in his business. And he was like, where, where's, uh, you know, where, where, where's the motivation here? Where's the, like the serotonin levels going to, right? I'm finding no joy in anything. He finds himself smoking a bunch of blunts. You know, tr <laughs> hopefully, like maybe the, 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 you know, the CBD and the marijuana is going to help me out. And he realized everything was just running down. And he realized that when he was playing the video game, that the serotonin levels would increase as he would be one level to the next level. And so he noticed he was shortening his happiness based upon 30 minutes of video game play, which turned into two to three hours. Or when he would go to the bar, which chick I could get tonight? Get her, get her, get her. And then it, he was narrowing it down. And he realized, this is preventing me. So he told me, you know what I did? I took my 3000 whatever dollar computer. I went out and I threw it in the pool. I threw it in the pool. I took my cell phone. I threw it in the pool. I think it was, I forget what he paid. It was one of the Apple phones. It was almost $1,000 when it came out a couple of years ago. Threw it in the pool. And he says, I took all those things. I threw it in the pool and destroyed it. And he says, you know what? And I sat there and I looked like an idiot. But because he did that, he was able to turn himself around. And he's making very good money now in business. Very good entrepreneur. Let me tell you, if that works in the physical, you better believe it's going to work in the spiritual. Yeshua says, whatever's causing you to sin, get rid of it. So you know a person who plays spiritual pussyfoot is the people who, who are complacent when they don't do teshuva because they won't get rid of what's keeping them back. That's when a person has to be uh, real with themselves, look themselves in the mirror and say, some days, you know, I overcome it. I overcome the temptation, but some days it doesn't overcome me. 
that person has to be able to overcome. I have a story of another friend who fell victim to drugs. Went off the deep end back in the States and he got addicted to crack. Now, I can't understand how people go that far on crack. You know, I was a pothead. I never dabbled with cocaine or anything. I was just a marijuana guy. You know, my brothers, they got into that stuff. My cousins, they got into that stuff. To me growing up in the projects, when you would turn to the coke and stuff and crack, you were easy to punk. You were, you can get robbed. So that was like a bad sign. You know, if you're going to smoke, you can do any drugs. Just do that, you know, smoke some pot, man. It's fine. You don't have a couple of booze as well. Anyway, my friend, you know, he got strung on crack and he was struggling, really struggling to overcome, really struggling. And um, one day he shares the story. He says, you know, I was, I was on the way to go buy some crack, man. I was on the way to buy some crack. And I was, I was drug free, he said, for like three months. And he says, but you know, life comes, throws you a curveball. And it's like your whole week falls from underneath you. All this pressure, all this pain. And you're striving. And next thing you know, the voices of the Yates Sahara come to you. And next thing you know, images come to you where you get this feel-good feeling of just relaxing. And what makes you relax? Not the beer, the crack pipe. So next thing you know, they go over there and he says he's driving. And he says it's about three miles out to the spot. And he says, you know, he's thinking, he's sitting in the drive parking lot of a restaurant, and he, he finds himself back in the road, slowly, slowly, finally gets there, does the exchange, gets the crack, goes back. And he's at a parking lot of the gas station, he's ready to smoke it. And he, he just snaps. He jumps out the car, and he looked like a lunatic. He starts yelling at the top of his lungs, I don't want to do this no more. Throws the crack pile on the ground, starts smashing it. People are looking at him. So imagine, people are looking in public. This is a busy gas station. Would anybody else do that? They would be worried about their honor, right? But he did that. And he recognizes that unless, and he had to go back. He had to tell me he had to go back and track, trace his steps to see what was it that caused him to get to here. He says he'd rather remove things in his life that would prevent him from doing that. And, you know, one of the things he recognized, he says, was his car. <laughs> he sold his car. Sold the car. <laughs> Took a taxi to work. These are extremes for some people. Why? Because we're talking about eternity here. We're talking about the eternal scope of the soul. You know? And we read in the Brach HaRashah, the Esau, over a bowl of lentils, right? <laughs> Basically forfeit his birthright. I mean, we don't think about it in that stream because, you know, we, we tend to think God loves us. The rabbi is saying, yeah, God loves you. But listen, the reality is when it comes to Shuvah, you have to do the work. God is willing to give you the atonement that you need, willing to forgive you. But you have to put the work in. And therefore, whatever it is that's causing you to sin, you have to shatter it to where it no longer exists. That's a struggle in today's world because once again, I spent $1,000 on this cell phone. You mean to tell me I need to get rid of it and go get one of those Nokia phones that you could play like Hangman on? Yeah. You mean to tell me I got to get rid of my PlayStation, my game console? I got to get rid of this partner I'm working with, this investor? Whatever it is that may be causing you to sin, you have to get rid of. If not, you're going to have this constant proverbial, sometimes you chase the dragon days, and other days the dragon chases you. And it's going to continue being repeated. And think about the, what that does to your mental state of mind. It ends up making people psychotic. It ends up lowering your serotonin levels, your testosterone levels, you know, it, it changes all of those things. It's, it's, it's a ploy in the mind. Because where do you think the, the seed of the soul is at? From the mind. And this is where the gates of horror wages his war at. And so Yeshua says, hey man, it's better for you to pass from this world, figuratively speaking, missing an eye, missing a hand, missing that thing, than you busting hell wide open while having access to all those sins. And this is the struggle. You know, back in the day when a person committed a sin, Especially they did brought an Ola offering. An Ola offering is when a person really wanted to ascend. They were sick and tired of being sick and tired. So the Ola, as we call it, a burnt offering, because everything weren't. Nobody got a piece of it. But imagine back in the day, the economy was different. You bring this massive animal to be put up, nobody gets it. You're not getting that was the animal that you used to plow your fields, right? Now you lost that animal, it's not making you money because it's not plowing the field. The Kohanim were not getting any of it. Everything was on the altar. But that's the price you pay if you want to spiritually elevate. Are you willing to lose something to gain something? This is what Rabbi Bakia Ibn Bakuda is sharing here. It's worth the struggle. And so when a person says, oh, you know, I'm a believer in Yeshua. Yeah, we'll see how much of a believer you are. Are you willing to lose an eye or an arm, metaphorically speaking? 
Are you willing to depart with something? And to start, that's Shuva. That's what this month is about here. And he goes on to say over here, hashlishli, regarding the third form of Shuva, is that one who meets all the conditions of Shuva, his soul overpowers the Yetzirah, his base desires. He examines his behavior regularly. It's a concept of Cheshbon Hanefesh. He's in awe of God and is diffident before him. He takes to heart the gravity of his sin and transgression, recognizing the great majesty of the one against whom he rebelled, whose words he has violated. He is ever conscious of his sins. It says sins, not sin, right? People have more than one. They are always before him, full of remorse. He asks forgiveness for them all the days of life till he comes to the end of his life. This is the individual who is found worthy to be saved by Hashem. This is a powerful teaching here. King David in Psalm chapter 51, 5, the very passage where he sinned with Bathsheba, right? You know, remember David says he couldn't bring any offerings to God. Why? Because he did a deliberate sin. There is no sin offerings for sins that are done via Pesha, a willful criminal sin. When a person willfully sins, you cannot bring a Chatat. Chatat is only for inadvertent sins. So David knew he deliberately sinned, so why would he try to abuse the law? By bringing a chatat for something he did as a pesha. That's why he said, Lord, open my lips. Because I don't know what to do. How can, I, how can I bring an animal before you? I did this sin. So like, how does David get atonement? Through shuva. Through his words. Through vowing before Hashem that he would never do this again. Smashing those idols in his life. That is the greatest form of, a, of an offering because you're offering yourself at this point. You're willing to sacrifice something in your life never to actually please it again. And David, later in that same passage, was Rabbi, uh, Rabbi uh, Bachai Ibn Bechuda says there, David says, Ki fasha'ai ani eda v'chatati negdi tamid. I am fully aware of my pesha, my criminal violence. And a pesha is a criminal. Once again, when we do tefillah, it's lehit palal, it's to judge. Why? Because we recognize we're criminals. My criminal sins. And he says, they are always negdi tamid. In another place, David would say, shiviti adonai le negdi tamid. Hashem is always before me. And here he says, my sin is always before me. You want to know the secret to Rosh Hashanah? When we all get concerned about God judging the world based upon our actions... We mentioned Rosh Hashanah is also called Yom HaZicharon in the Torah. Literally the day of remembering. Let's think about that. God is not a physical being. He doesn't have a memory bank in his brain like we do, right? We, we, we forget what we learned yesterday. <laughs> we forget what we learned. And therefore, we, we have spiritual ADHD. We're always forgetting. God doesn't forget nothing. He's a spirit. So why does it mean the day of remembering? I mean, God want to throw all our past regrets in our face? No. The secret to obtaining uh, kapara, uh, atonement on Yom Kippur, 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, is based upon the human being. When a person goes before Hashem, like the attitude with King David, just as Rabbi uh, uh, Bachia Ibn Pachuda says, that when a person is ever conscious of his sin, my sin is always before me, I remember that is what Yom HaZicharon is. It's you. Rosh Hashanah is for the human. It's I remember that I am not worth anything before you. I am nothing. I am the lowest of the low. Now, a person shouldn't say that in a sense of like low self-esteem, but they're being genuinely honest with themselves. I have failed. I've done this. And therefore, when their sin remains before them, you know what that does? It keeps them humble. It will prevent them from going out to do the sin again. Why? Because when a person, the Ram Khal says it also in another way in Masil Shasharim, that when flesh and blood stand before Hashem, and they stand before Hashem, and they recognize, I'm actually worth nothing. He alludes to the passage in Nehemiah. When Ezra and Nehemiah, they come before Hashem, and they say they feel like garbage because of the sin of their forefathers. They recognize that they're worth nothing. How in the world can something flesh and blood created in the image of God stand before Him? And not feel a sense of shame of the things they did or the thoughts they have thought. You know? And so this idea here, the individual that's really worthy of Shuva, is the individual who is willing to uproot, whatever it is that's causing them to sin. 
whatever is causing them to struggle, they're willing to get rid of it. And when they do shuva, what comes before their mind when they're doing teshuva, when they pray before Hashem, is images of shame. Shameful things come before their mind, and they feel cringy on the inside. This is the secret to Shuvah. To Shuvah, the prophets say, rend your hearts, not your garments. You know? In the Hasidic world, I'm not sure how many Hasidim do this today, but back in the day, there would be stories of Hasidic rabbis basically correcting their Talmudim. One rabbi saw one of his disciples one day out in the snow, rolling around in the snow. Because some of the Hasidim thought if you did like this uh, the self-negation by basically putting yourself through like, you know, some type of form of uh, ritual, aesthetic worship, like those in the Far East do, somehow you're like basically disciplining the body because you feel like, you know, you feel like crap for what you did. And God's going to accept that. The Rebbe was watching his disciple from a distance, take his shirt off, roll around. He took a whip and was hitting himself in the back and everything like that. And so the Rebbe comes over and says, you know, he says, you know, what are you doing? He says, oh, Rebbe, I'm doing teshuva. I did a horrible sin. You know, I did a horrible sin. I spilled my seed in vain. I, in other words, he had sexual relations with a girl. And he says, I, 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 you know, I'm so sorry. And he says, uh, I understand it. According to the gematria of the word Zara in Hebrew, that's how many days I need to do a fast. So I'm going to do a fast. I'm, I'm, I'm negating myself right now. And the Rebbe just says, this is not teshuva. This is not teshuva. And he says, you see that horse over there? The horse was rolling around in the snow. That horse has a bit in its mouth. That horse gets whipped. That horse rolls around the stone. And you know what it still is? It's still a horse. <laughs> it's still a horse. You're not a horse. In other words, this is not teshuva is what he's saying. Teshuva is the sense of remorse. The feeling of shame. The feeling of cringiness inside of you before Hashem. That is what you act upon. The resolve that you act upon from that moment is what leads you to true teshuva. Because once again, teshuva is the idea you don't go back and do the sin again. You don't go back to the vomit. Right now, you're still going back to the vomit. And you think doing these things are going to somehow please you, and it makes you more depressed. And so what we see here is that when our sins are always before us, it's a good thing. Why? Because it keeps us humble. Because we sit there and we think, you know what? Yeah, I don't want to go back there again. You know, I feel like I feel nasty. I feel bad. You know, I feel like a fool. And when as long as that image is before a person, it will prevent them from going back. Now, of course, the more they uproot things from their life, figuratively speaking, pluck their eye out, cut their hand off, as Yeshua taught. Oh, would they save themselves some heartache and pain because now they're not gonna go over there. When you rip something up out of your life, especially something you spent money on, oh that's gonna hurt. <laughs> that's gonna hurt. And you better believe, when that thing is not there in your life, what's the Yitzhahara going to do? Hey, you know what? Go spend three grand again on that thing again. No. You know why? I'm going to go through all that hardships and efforts to spend three grand on this, work the hours to get it, and then, you know, to do everything. No, 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 it's not even worth it. I'm not even going to do it. Right then and there, you stop. And then you feel the sense of shame of what you did with the material, and you get rid of it. This is the path of teshuva. This is how a person starts doing teshuva. Teshuva is not easily just asking God for forgiveness. No, no. The key to forgiveness is the person has to forgive themselves first. That's the part of teshuva. They have to forgive themselves. Teshuva is on the path of the human. God gave, his, gave teshuva to us as a gift. Because once again, according to the Torah, if we go right to the letter of the law, hey, you sin, you die. Your own blood is supposed to be the consequence. Now you got to consider this in the legalistic contract of the covenant God has with Israel. You're my servant, I'm your master, you do what the servant said. Now if you go back in time, back in the plantation field, when they had slavery, down there in Alabama, down there in Mississippi, down there in Galveston, Texas, down there in Louisiana, and you go back in the day when you had them white slave masters, and they told a slave that they brought in the house, something they called Uncle Tom, where they get the slang term from. And you go in there, and really the slave master, really, he, he had a thing for a lot of the black ladies. That's really what happened there, you know. So anyway, he had, a, he had a guy he brought in. And this slave doesn't do what he's told to do. You know what happens? He's killed. No if and buts about it. Now, I know it's hard to use such an analogy in, from an oppression thing, but that's the reality. The Arabs did it as well. Slavery existed with the Arabs before, the, before they existed with John Hawkins in 1555. 
They did it with the uh, the Arabs did it in parts of Africa and stuff like that. And the idea was, hey, hey, you don't do you don't do what you're told, you're killed. That's the same thing with God and Israel. You're my servants. You don't do what the master says, I'll kill you. Done. But God doesn't do that. God gives us the shuva. It's a measure of grace. And the dangers of that measure of grace is that, once again, as I shared here, the Yitzhahara comes along and says, hey, you could do this today, you could do that tomorrow. And the next day, go over there and do idolatry. We would never think of doing something so extreme, but you know what? It becomes justifiable when we don't do shuva right away, when we don't act right away, when we don't get rid of the thing that's actually preventing us from drawing close to God, when we don't figuratively speak, cut our hand or pluck our eye out. The more we delay that, the more that thing becomes a part of us. It becomes ingrained into us. It's almost like an undercover cop who goes inside like a mafia and he goes too far undercover. He forgets who he really is. He becomes corrupted. What happens? They have to get rid of him. They might even have to take him out. Why? He went too far underneath. And that's what happens with our sins. They become so much a part of us that we have a hard time recognizing that it's a sin. Especially in today's day. Such a politically oriented generation, so liberal, right? That they don't have a bad eyelash at certain things that the Torah considers a erroneous sin. But yet in the world today, everything's justifiable. Completely justifiable. You know, the irony, even like, let's say in the political thing, you have people right now who are trying to run for the president of the United States on the Democrat side who get upset because there's pregnant women who go to the border of Texas and are turned away because of the border crisis. And they'll say, oh, those poor babies. But I'm like, you're an idiot because you advocate abortion. So why aren't you fighting for the life in the womb of the woman just as much as you're willing to fight for the illegal immigrant? You see the problem with that? But because it's liberal, oh, no problem. You know, have as much kids as you want or kill them all you want, right? The idea is that because there's no morality painted, sin becomes so easy to be justified in today's day age, it's very dangerous. And that's why it's hard for people to do teshuva. It's a very difficult thing. So I'm going to end there. Any questions on anything I mentioned here? You know, feel free to ask. You know, it's important to have this before the front of our mind here, especially during the month of Elul. It's important because, like I said, it's, it, you know, we're dealing with something spiritual. This is not just religion. We're dealing with transitions into the uh, things that are happening in the spiritual world. And as we transition into the year 50, 70, 80, I mean, where do we want to be at? For a lot of us, to, you know, we want to overcome certain sins. <laughs> and we want to overcome these habits. But where are we willing to do it? What are we willing to acquire? We have to, be, we have to make sure that we're willing to, uh, you know, to remove those things from us. You know, as I shared yesterday, like in war, a soldier can't risk his life. And in war, a soldier has to do without things. You know? has to, the, the, the less of things, the better you know, in that situation. So this should be the path to Shuva for us. So with that said, uh, yeah, Conrad. Um, I don't uh, read into the art yet. It's on my acquisition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. In his merits and demerits. Yep. He uses one of the words that he refers to as tempted. Right. And he also uses remorse. So, uh, uh, on the question of penitence, he, he stipulated uh, remorse for sin. Not remorse, sorry. Re renunciation of sin, remorse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the obligation not to lapse back Correct. to sin. Mm -hmm. So having said that, uh, is a, a kind of building on... Uh, on uh, yeah, he actually, yeah, he builds that. He goes uh, like a... Yeah, he does, he does build a progression of it. So because he calls it a sha'ar, a gate, and he goes to the various levels. So that's exactly what he does. And one of the things that's important that you point out there, especially when we think about Yom Kippur and forgiveness... Uh, Yom Kippur is incomplete without confession, right? So it's the idea why we have to confess, we have to do a slicha, we ask for forgiveness. The idea is that the actions, the words, and it, all these are steps that the sinner has to take upon himself. And, and yeah, in uh, Rabbi uh, Bachet Ibn Pakuri, he builds upon this. He builds upon it. He goes in a lot more detail as well and he breaks it down. So very good, yeah. He builds on it. So thank you for the question, yeah. Any other questions, guys? No? All right, great. So everyone have a wonderful day, all right? And uh, we'll see you, see you later on during the week, all right? Everyone online, uh, call to have a good day.